we're doing part two of the best and worst horror movies of 2023. In this video, we're going to be talking about The Mids. 42 was Skinamarink. That's what we left off at in the previous video. So we're going to continue on with number 41, controversial one, which is Nefarious. On the day of his scheduled execution, a convicted serial killer tells a psychiatrist that he's a demon who can possess his body. As the evaluation ends, he also tells the doctor that he will soon commit three murders of his own. This is one of those chamber pieces set primarily within the confines of a state penitentiary. I actually enjoyed that aspect of it because I do like films that take place in one location, primarily one location. It's a very dialogue-driven film. Sean Patrick Flannery gives a great performance going between the meek Edward Wayne Brady and the manipulative Nefarious. And while it is predictable because I kind of called it already how the film was going to conclude, I mean, I still like the climax with seeing what happens to Edward Wayne Brady, and then also the scene of divine intervention. I liked it. I can't complain about that. However, here's where I am going to criticize this film, and it's specifically the context within this piece of content. So what's being said about euthanasia, abortion, the execution of an inmate. I think it's very heavy handed with the message it's trying to convey, and that's probably like where I had big red flags just being raised. And then when I did further investigation and reading about this movie and the creators, I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Now I can look at different ideological perspectives. I don't have a problem with that. I just feel like it's almost like a marketing ploy or it's a little bit deceptive the way they went about making this movie. I get that it's an independently made film and they're trying to broaden their horizons by marketing it to non-believers. I think that's what this movie is basically intended for. Like some of the things within the film, they don't explicitly refer to Jesus by his name. They call him the carpenter. I really don't know how much of the novel bleeds into this film, if what revisions were made. That's pretty much where I land with this movie is that it's just very <laughs> preachy. And with demonic possession sort of films, what really kind of irritates me with them is the tropes that are used constantly. So there being a non-believer atheist who converts, who has an awakening and becomes a believer in the end. So with that said, Dr. James Martin, who was a character that the actor who played Dr. James Martin did a great job, but the character itself, yeah. Um, I don't don't really like the way it's framed. I guess I'm maybe reading way into it, at least for my interpretation. You can let me know if I'm wrong and I will correct myself. There's no shame in that. But I took it as like a mirror being held up, like a reflection of how modern society is like with individualism, technological advances, and immoral behaviors. That's the message I'm taking in, specifically, you know, the secular world. You can let me know if I'm just going on a long-winded rant. Which brings me to my next point of propaganda versus persuasion. Is this film more propaganda-centric, or is it supposed to be persuasive? I think it's leaning more towards propaganda. I don't think it helps also that Glenn Beck makes a cameo appearance at the end, which I was like, ooh. In 1956 France, a priest is violently murdered, prompting Sister Irene's investigation. She once again comes face to face with Balak, a powerful demonic entity. Distributed by Netflix and serving as a prequel to the 2017 film Veronica, Sister Death follows Sister Narcissa, a novice nun teaching at a Catholic girls' school. She quickly is thrust into a haunting involving a deceased girl, a nun, and visions of horror from the Spanish Civil War. When two girls disappear into the woods and return three days later with no memory of what happened to them, the father of one girl seeks out Chris McNeil, who's been forever altered by what happened to her daughter 50 years ago. Okay, so let's get this out of the way right now. So obviously I wasn't the biggest fan of David Gordon Green's Halloween trilogy with the exception of maybe the 2018. Now with The Exorcist, I did wait until it was on Peacock to watch, and I was a little bit nervous because of the negativity and some of the hate that it got. But strangely, I didn't dislike it as much as I thought I would. With this movie, I do like the way that it begins with Victor and his wife vacationing in Haiti, mirroring the shift in locale like the first film. And just an interesting fact that I learned was that the woman performing the blessing was in fact a voodoo priestess from what I had read, which I thought was really cool as far as like adding a layer of authenticity. Now moving on from past events after Victor has to make a choice because of an earthquake, when we get introduced to Angela, her and her friend Catherine, obviously they go to the woods and they perform a seance, which isn't shown 
but they're found three days later. Something that I did want to point out as far as girls, Lydia Jewett and Olivia O'Neill, is that I actually really did enjoy their performances. They're fine as playing ordinary teenage girls, but I think it was fine as well when they turned into, you know, the demonic version of them themselves. Being that it is an exorcist film, there is going to be the obligatory vomiting, the head spinning, the demonic foul language that's uttered. But I mean, I expected that. The things that do bring this movie down for me is one, Ellen Burstyn's character, Chris McNeil. I think she is very underutilized and I was just not a fan of what happens to her, even though it's supposed to mirror what Reagan did or what Pazuzu made Reagan do in the first movie. But I will say it's it's cool seeing, you know, the different theological backgrounds of people coming together and uniting against evil. I just wasn't really the biggest fan of the way the exorcism was treated itself. I just don't think there was as much like tension or nail biting scares in that moment. There is, however, like a scene with one of the girls later on when, when a certain choice is made, which I actually did find terrifying for one reason or another. I don't know if it's because it's a child. I don't know if it's because I really enjoyed the girls' performances. So I felt like connected to them. And, you know, obviously you, you don't want them to die, but that's, I kind of had it figured out what was going to happen. Also for the people that do like seeing legacy characters come back, I think there is a nice little surprise at the end. But one thing that was heavy on my mind with this movie was, was the demon in fact Pazuzu. And so I read an article where I think the director made a statement or somebody working on the film made a statement saying that it's not, it's actually a demonic entity or goddess named Lamashtu. A reimagining of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as Vicaria, a brilliant teenager who believes death is a disease that can be cured. After the brutal murder of her brother, she embarks on a dangerous journey to bring him back to life, which proved to have dire consequences. Swedish Horror, the conference released back in October on Netflix and follows a team building conference for municipal employees that turns into a nightmare when accusations of corruption begin to circulate and plague the work environment. At the same time, a mysterious figure begins murdering the participants. Psychiatrist Elizabeth Derby becomes obsessed with helping a young patient who is suffering from extreme personality disorder. However, it soon leads her into occult danger as she tries to escape from a horrific fate. So this film is directed by Joe Lynch, who did Mayhem, a movie that I thoroughly enjoyed. There were several reasons why I really wanted to watch this movie. One, Barbara Crampton. Two, Heather Graham. And three, the fact that it is an H.P. Lovecraft tale. So it's based loosely on the Lovecraft story, The Thing on the Doorstep from 1937. But there is a nice dedication at the end for Stuart Gordon, who directed Reanimator, a movie that I still love, rave about, but also from Beyond and a few others. But also the screenplay is by Dennis Paoli, who worked with Stuart Gordon, which you think would be a recipe for a perfect film, considering that I love cosmic horror. And you see it in the film explicitly once Dr. Derby goes to her patient's home, goes to the father's study and sees all these like necromancy illustrations, presumably Cthulhu. And it is focused on this body swapping entity that revels in eroticism. It is hypersexual. It is a very hypersexual film. For some reason, it just didn't really quite land for me. Like whether it was trying to be funny or mirroring those 80s films, I didn't think it quite landed with either the horror or the comedy. It isn't until the second half of the movie where I start to enjoy it more. And especially in the third act, there is a scene with Dr. Derby backing up the car and there's this POV with the camera as it's hitting her patient. I thought that was brilliant, but also when she's in the psych ward and she escapes, taken over by this entity and there's just this like frenzy of body swapping madness. She's in her hospital gown, pointing a pistol and the way it's framed with her looking crazed, I think that was brilliant as well. Randy is perfectly content to fade into the background, but when one of his coworkers goes on a sudden and violent rampage, he must face his fears and confront his troubled past to survive. Now, if you're looking for a folk horror, consider Lord of Misrule, which came out December 8th. So this film is about a priest who begins a desperate search when her daughter goes missing during the local harvest festival. As she uncovers secrets from the town's dark past, she must decide how much she's willing to sacrifice to rescue the girl from the grip of evil. The third installment to its predecessors, 13 Cameras and 14 Cameras, respectively, follows a couple, Cam and Skye, who invest in a duplex. Infamous for hidden cameras and a psycho landlord, Skye becomes obsessed with a documentary series called The Slumlord Tapes, which recounts the serial killer's terror while Cam taps into deranged levels of voyeurism with the arrival of two new tenants, all the while someone else is observing their every move. So I haven't watched the previous films, but this one was 
kind of a nice surprise. A little hidden gem thanks to Blair for picking this one out. And strangely, it is a little unsettling. It's pretty cheeky, it's pretty comical, but there are some drawbacks. So first and foremost, the acting, it's a bit stunted, it's a bit awkward. It's not necessarily the best. But I can move past that. There is that central theme of fear, of paranoia, and surveillance, but it takes a while before it finds its footing. It's not even until like the third act that I think it's its strongest point because of the culmination of chaos that's just happening. And I wish it would have just spread throughout the film. And then the end credits, they're hilarious. Strangely, what was effective for me was not the serial killer in the movie. It was actually Cam. Like he was just really unsettling. He was cringeworthy. The way he would just stalk the new tenants, these college-aged girls, just observe their every move. For example, there's a scene in the movie where Cam is observing the girls, and one of them is talking about wanting a guy to just be bold, ask her out on a date. And that prompts this weirdo <laughs> to literally take a picture of his penis and send it to her, which obviously she's disgusted. Instead of admitting his wrongdoing or rectifying the situation, he tries to double down and just like, no, it was meant for, you know, Sky and just makes every situation worse for him. I think that's what makes it so unsettling is how cringeworthy and just the secondhand embarrassment, just watching this individual just be a complete train wreck. But yeah, if you haven't heard of this movie and you want something a little bit different that does involve cameras and surveillance and a creepy neighbor and also a serial killer thrown in the mix, um, go ahead and watch this one. Social media influencer Madison is struggling on a solo backpacking trip in Thailand when she meets CW who travels with ease and shows her a more uninhibited way of living. However, CW's interest in her takes a darker turn. During the pandemic, Parker and her best friend Miri decide to quarantine in a luxurious lakeside cabin until one night when a mass intruder breaks in the house intent on killing them. Now Parker and Miri must fight for their lives and survive the night. A rookie police officer takes the last shift at a newly decommissioned station in an attempt to uncover the mysterious connection between her father's death and a vicious cult. Throughout the night, she finds herself barraged by terrifying supernatural events while unveiling the truth behind her family's twisted past. Malum is a reimagining of the 2014 film Last Shift. I will admit it was terrifying, and a part of that has to do with my own bias because I am really invested in learning about cults. I always find it really interesting every time I'm on YouTube and just watching all these videos. There are stark differences with both films. For example, Malum, it's more polished. There's a higher budget. Of course, I'm going to end up comparing both films because it's by the same director and co-writer. I think with Last Shift, it's a lot more cohesive as far as a story without including so much context. I think that's what drives Malum down, like way down for me. Uh, there are a lot of flashbacks. There's a lot of, you know, questioning whether what you're witnessing is a hallucination or reality, or if you're in the present or in the past. Not that I don't mind that non-linear format. I think it's just that tacking on so much, a lot of unnecessary information in my personal opinion. However, there are aspects of Malum that are really great. For example, the special effects, which is by Russell Effects. And I'm not gonna lie, I had to look them up because I was thinking to myself, they sound so familiar. And then once I saw what they're credited for working on, such as the new Hellraiser movie Glorious that I watched, which I really wasn't a big fan of. And then Joe Bago's movies, uh, with the exception of Bliss, the other two that I really like, one is VFW, which I've talked about on this channel, and then Christmas Bloody Christmas, which I talked about last year's Best and Worst. It was an honorable mention, but I actually just recently watched that movie and I watched it two times in a row the night before Christmas. With that said, I was invested in the way they appeared, the creatures, the cult. It's just that the scares, and there are jump scares, they didn't get me at any point. That was a difference with Last Shift. Last Shift actually creeped me out. And for some reason, even the poster of Last Shift kind of just unsettling for one reason or another. Desperate to fit in at school, Sam rejects her East Indian culture and family to be like everyone else. However, when a mythological demonic spirit latches onto her former best friend, she must come to terms with her heritage to defeat it. Released to Hulu September 19th, No One Will Save You's film about Bryn, a girl who finds solace within the walls of the home where she grew up until she's awakened one night by strange noises from unearthly intruders. 
While vacationing at a remote cabin in the woods, a young girl and her parents are taken hostage by four armed strangers who demand they make an unthinkable choice to avert the apocalypse. Confused, scared, and with limited access to the outside world, the family must decide what they believe before all is lost. A wildlife volunteer on an uninhabited island off the British coast descends into a terrifying madness that challenges her grip on reality and pushes her into a living nightmare. So this one is directed by Mark Jenkin and it does star Mary Woodbine who is credited as the volunteer. Now this movie, little to no dialogue, and it's really repetitive with the actions that are involved such as the volunteer going out observing these flowers and then writing about it, documenting it in her journal with the results that yield no change. A lot of things that seem to happen that are interspersed with like ghastly images of minors and then Cornish women in folk attire and this teenage girl in a statue, which is a pivotal point, as well as a boatman. Like, what does all this mean? Because she's performing mundane activities such as dropping a rock down a cistern or a well, starting the generator, you know, just doing really mundane activities. But what does all this mean? Because Ennis Main translated is Stone Island. I'm not going to have the exact answers. It's all up for interpretation. So it could be a range of things, such as the volunteer being mentally depleted, being isolated. It could be a metaphor for her entirely being synonymous with the island that she's inhabiting. Other than the imagery involved, the part that I'm trying to grapple with is the connection with her and the flowers when she notices that they have lichen like growing on the flowers, and then she too develops fungus growing out of her. So I'm just trying to really piece all that together. I would really like if somebody who loves these type of experimental films, let me know. Another point that I wanted to make was that there is a radio report that suggests the boatman died May 1973, while the volunteer reports are dated April 1973. So I'm wondering with the same fishermen delivering her supplies, it's not easily able to ascertain or grip onto anything tangible because of what little is given. Yeah, I, I really don't have a conclusion to what is going on in this movie. I'm sorry, maybe I'm just not intelligent enough to decipher all these little bits if there is a message. With Ennis Main, the threads of a story, or lack thereof, not a point of interest, but I think what I did like about this movie is what kept my attention strangely throughout the whole film is how beautiful it is because it's got that grainy 16 millimeter color film that it's shot on and it does seem to mirror like a lot of 70s movies. When Remy is expelled from her religious cult, she joins the secret world of truck stop sex workers. Remy soon navigates between her strained faith and her new group's code to find her true calling in life. Loosely based on true events, Cocaine Bear tells the story of a black bear that consumes a significant amount of cocaine and embarks on a drug-fueled rampage through a Georgia forest, endangering the lives of cops, criminals, tourists, and teenagers. 35 years after the shocking murders of three teens, an infamous killer returns on Halloween night to claim a fourth victim. When 17-year-old Jamie comes face to face with a mass maniac, she accidentally time travels back to 1987. Forced to navigate the unfamiliar culture, Jamie teams up with her teenage mother to take down the psycho once and for all. What makes Holy Killer funny is the dichotomy with Jamie and her 1987 peers when she first gets there. After time traveling, she just starts critiquing the environment that she's in, all her surroundings, and calling people out for being insensitive or problematic. Time travel movies in general are really fun and just seeing the ripple effects. Even the commentary on true crime consumption and just content creation in general being a reflection of the world that we live in. Really funny with one particular character in mind. Also at the end with the reveal, I called it. I don't know if I'm just getting better at like identifying the killers and whodunit situations. This movie was actually entertaining throughout because Karen and Shipka. Aside from that, I really did want to talk about the design of the mask because I was thinking something along the lines of the Max Headroom incident, but I was pretty far off, I'm not going to lie. So this was from an article that I found. So the article states, the killer's identity is unknown because they wear a mask depicting the face of a grinning blonde haired man designed by makeup wizard Tony Gardner of Zombieland and Seed of Chucky. Khan explains that the mask had to originate in the 80s, so you have to have that nostalgic vibe, but in our movie, people still dress up like the killer in present day, so I wanted it to feel a little bit relevant. We landed on the idea of a handsome man being terrifying. Tony Gardner and our design team started pulling 80s heartthrob references like Kiefer Sutherland, Rob Lowe, Dolph Lundgren, and even Johnny Bravo, and then exaggerated it and made the teeth oversized. 
Now retired and living in self-imposed exile in the world's most glamorous city, Perot reluctantly attends a seance at a decaying, haunted palazzo. He soon gets thrust into a sinister world of shadows and secrets when one of the guests is murdered. Seven friends go away for the weekend, only to find themselves trapped in a cabin with a killer who has a vendetta. They must pit their street smarts and knowledge of horror movies against the murderer to stay alive. Renfield, the tortured aide to his narcissistic boss, Dracula, is forced to procure his master's prey and do his every bidding. However, after centuries of servitude, he's ready to see if there's a life outside the shadow of the Prince of Darkness. Peter is plagued by a mysterious constant noise from inside his bedroom wall, a tapping that his parents insist is his imagination. As his fear intensifies, he starts to believe that his parents are hiding a terrible and dangerous secret. Now, if you're looking for a seasonal treat, a movie that takes place around slash on Halloween, this movie is it. Between Anthony Starr and Lizzie Kaplan's performance as the parents, it kind of has this dark fantasy aspect to it, which remind me of the people under the stairs and Coraline. It was a film that was fun to follow, and there's a point in the movie that actually did kind of creep me out, which is when Peter unlocks the door and you hear like this maniacal laughter. But a few things that I didn't like that I thought were really tropey, and it kind of reminded me of another movie that I watched that I do like a lot, um, Antlers is you know child being bullied child drawing some weird obscure shit and the teacher intervening which is i think a common trope that we've seen but then the third act of it is where i feel really mixed on because the reveal of what is hiding within the walls while there is a lot of carnage involved once we get like a close-up view of what it is i i I don't know just feel kind of weird on it i don't know if it's just the effects that are used it looks too familiar like something like a creature or a person that we've seen already in horror films. You know what I mean? You know. And this supernatural horror about Father Gabriele Amor, chief exorcist of the Vatican. The Pope's exorcist follows Amor as he investigates a young boy's terrifying possession and ends up uncovering a centuries-old conspiracy the Vatican has desperately tried to keep hidden. When Gemma becomes the unexpected caretaker of her eight-year-old niece, she creates an AI-powered lifelike doll named Megan, programmed to be a child's greatest companion. Underestimating the prototype's highly adaptive functions and overly protective instincts over Katie lead to catastrophic consequences. High school students and Sadie Harper and her younger sister Sawyer are still reeling from the recent death of their mother. They're not getting much support from their father, Will, a therapist who's dealing with his own intense pain. When a desperate patient unexpectedly shows up at their house seeking help, he leaves behind a terrifying supernatural entity that preys on families and feeds on the suffering of its victims. So this one is based off the Stephen King short story of the same name, but this film adaptation what is the driving force with carrying that dread throughout is the contrasted lighting similar to chiaroscuro paintings like Sawyer holding her nightlight which is this glowing orb and everything around her is dark. One of the most effective scenes in this movie is when she rolls it under her bed revealing the creature which we do see in the trailer. Being that it is a PG-13 flick and working within the confines of what they can I really like the gradual reveal of the boogeyman. I think that's what kept me really engaged because the creature design of this thing. Utter insanity. <laughs> Not to mention the dynamic between the sisters and the way that they process grief. The only exception would be the father. I think he kind of annoyed me a bit just because I get that he's going through his own suffering but he was pretty negligent of his children. However what brings down my score a bit which pains me because I really wanted to add this one in my best is the similarities with other films that we've seen as far as like grief and pain being the central theme such as Smile. Aside from that, Sadie's friend group, unnecessary to the plot. They went unscathed and really unnecessary, honestly. But other than that, what I was saying before, the creature design, the balancing between CG and practical, loved it. I, I don't know if people really liked it as much because this one, there's another movie that I just mentioned, like the synopsis, li lives inside. And with that movie, let me know if anybody felt the same way, but the Boogeyman, It Lives Inside, both creatures kind of remind me of each other, except I found the Boogeyman actually terrifying, this quadruped that moves in a spider-like way with a unique mouthpiece. Totally unnerving. So that concludes my list for the mid-horror movies of 2023. Let me know what you guys think, if there are any that don't deserve to be in this section. Uh, I will be back in a day or so to talk about my best. Let me just say, that list is all over the place. But I hope you guys are having a good night, and I'll be back soon. Bye, guys.